Is Hello? Uh, Hello? Hello? Oh, is that Jamie Shannon? Hello, this is Jamie Shannon. Can you hear me? Rocco. Jamie, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. All for right. This episode of Rocco Reviews. All right, nice to meet you. Jamie, we got a lot of burning questions for you. But the first one that I that all the fans are wondering, what is your favorite cut of meat? Oh, well. Jeez. You know, I am a I'm a real turkey lover. I got myself a, a turkey deep fryer this uh, winter finally, um cuz I'd heard so much about it and it was the best. It really it took me 50 minutes and I fed so many happy people. Thanksgiving. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, how has the puppet bunker been for you during the COVID pandemic? You know, you know, I don't know what it is with puppets, but they've become super popular. I, I've been more busy than I've ever been in my life. I've been more busy than I've ever been in my life, and that, and also so of other puppeteers. So it's not just me. They're doing the Fraggles again. They're doing a show called Brendar the Barbarian. There was a shoot up here. There's I've been making stuff like crazy. It's it's awesome. I'm helping out um, with something called Slumberland with Jason Malmoa. They're shooting a a series with that. So there's just I think it's I think it has something to do with the fact that puppets are kind of a little more heartwarming than computer graphics. So the world just kind of wants them right now. So yeah, so. COVID-19 and the pandemic, yeah, has had a lot of people indoors. And it sounds like uh, you're of the few that maybe it hasn't affected directly negatively in, in the way that you're working and you're, you know, being in. Because a lot of people are unemployed and stuff. I so. know. It's rough. I, I really feel bad for so many friends and so many people who are in industries that are just obliterated by this. So it's pretty tragic. The only thing I'm doing is sitting on my couch a bit too much. So my, my cat's happy. My cat's very happy that I'm home. My physical activity really could use some upgrading. I'm, I'm, I set up a room upstairs so I can do a little bit of stretching. I think that we're all a little guilty of that these days. Yeah. Um, so I want to get into uh, Mr. Meaty. I want to start with how did, how did Mr. Meaty go from just being, you know, the simple seed idea in your head to next thing you know, it's on Nickelodeon. That was, I mean, that was such a huge, amazing opportunity, but I had made a show called Nanolan and it was, it's pretty well loved by a lot of people. So there was an executive at CBC who loved Nanolan and he said, can you do something for teenagers? And my partner and I had just come off of making Nanolan. So we didn't even spend that much time thinking about it. We were just like, what do we do? We'll just maybe base it on our lives growing up in a mall and, uh, you know, thinking of ideas for movies, because <laughs> which is what we spent our youth doing. So I have, uh, I was, we had made these, these few shorts and then a Nickelodeon executive was up in, in Canada um, and he was at the Ottawa Animation Festival and he saw Nanoland on TV and he was like, who are these guys? And he uh, got in touch with us and we said, well, we just did a bunch of shorts called Mr. Meaty. And then he just pushed it right through and they just made it happen. It was really fun. It was, uh, you know, such big budgets, so many dreams. Like I made it because it was such a creative show. I got to make so many things I had always wanted to make. So you said that somebody had approached you earlier about doing show and then that's why you started making the shorts yeah yeah exactly so then what happened to that guy you told him to screw off and then you did the nickelodeon gave, gave it to nickelodeon instead or what happened there well he was just cbc so it was playing on cbc and nickelodeon was it no it wasn't um i forget <laughs> i kind of forget how did that happen they complete they continued to play the the shorts which are the one thing that I'm able to show on YouTube without Viacom taking it down. So there's, you know, the uh, chicken and the tar and the the fart. You know, there's a bunch of shorts up. Uh, up, And you can kind of tell it was like the original Mr. Meaty had a, we did it like Mr. Potato Head where we, we stuck on nose and ears and that kind of thing. So you can kind of see the seam 
So those were the original shorts, which are still out there getting lots of love. So that's interesting. So you, you just have access to that really early stuff, but those full episodes that aired on Nickelodeon, you, like, you haven't watched those in years? I, you know what's funny? I didn't even have a copy of it, so I ended up purchasing my own bootleg of it. And I've checked it out, and uh, it's lovely. And I, I wish it was out there. Like, I, I'm not sure where people are seeing them, because there's only a few on YouTube. I know none of my best ones are even out there. So I would like to... I wish Nickelodeon would put out a DVD or re-release it. Because there's some masterpieces, especially in the second season. Yeah, that's the funny thing. is I've, I've managed to find a good handful of episodes on Vimeo, surprisingly enough. Yep. Um, I found like, I think there's like 10 or 12 like full episodes on there. Uh, but when you look for like season two stuff, it's just like, there's like nothing. It's all season one stuff. So I don't, I don't even know what season two is like from other than just like faint memories from childhood. So it's very, wow. it's very strange. There's a lot of forms in like the, uh, those kind of like lost media forms. And yep. a lot of people talk about Mr. Media and how it's like this lost show in that sense. Yeah, that's that's too bad. Maybe I can figure out how to upload some to you know, or something. Because I just, I just want people to see them. Uh, that's my main sort of gist of things. And even the ones that are sort of on YouTube, I think it just got, it was just lucky. Some people uploaded them before, I guess they started taking them down yeah the the blu-ray one that you have that actually that bootleg that you have does it not have those season two episodes on it it does actually it does oh okay so you do have them interesting i do so, i have i have copies but i would love the world to see them because they're some really funny ones although the first season like have you seen park arena or unicorn or schnozola park arena is i've seen all of those and park, park arena is definitely a favorite of mine yeah ditto <laughs> that one's crazy. That one's um, but uh, so moving forward, uh, your show really wasn't like any th anything else on the network at the time. Did you feel like outsiders or rebels within Nickelodeon airing things like SpongeBob and whatnot? You know, you know what's funny. I think as an artist, I just kind of make things that are not. I never think I'm making outlandish things, but I it always is. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I, we actually were like, okay, let's do it. You know, it's like Ren and Stimpy, gross out humor. All right, let's do it. And uh, we thought we were kind of making something kind of Nick-like even. So there you go. I think, uh, you know, it, it's just sort of, I did think we were making it for an older age group than the Saturday mornings that it played on. That was definitely a, a, a truth of that. So it kind of frightened some kids because I think really only six and seven-year-olds watch Saturday morning cartoons anymore. And we kind of were aiming for like 11, 12, tween, tweensville. Yeah, totally. Um, it definitely had that uh, experience. I think a lot of kids had that that experience with Mr. Meaty. Um, <laughs> I personally, uh, I remember the first time that I saw Mr. Meaty on Nickelodeon. I was much younger. I don't know. What was that? How long ago has it been now? 10 years or something like that? Yeah, I think it was like... 2007 and 2008? Do you yeah. think around there? Yeah. That's what I think it is. That sounds yeah. right. Yeah, so I, I, remember, uh, I remember the first time I saw it, I saw the infamous tapeworm episode, which is always talked about when the show gets brought up. And, every, and it's, it makes every top 10 list of weirdest, weirdest kid shows. Totally, absolutely. And uh, I remember seeing that episode and just like, having my mind blown and then uh literally and, and it, it, it definitely terrified me as like a kid and then i remember any time i would be at a friend's house or just at my own house if i heard the mr meaty theme song like start up I, my heart would just start racing and i like i was like i gotta find the remote because i, I gotta turn it off because i'm so scared that i'll see that episode again and obviously, as an adult, I've, like, I've come around, and, like, now I really love the show, and I have this newfound, like, adoration for it and what you do, uh, but as a kid, it was just, like, oh, it was, like, my first experience of just, like, true primal fear, just, like, <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
You know, that's so funny. It played, when it played on CBC, which the tapeworm episode was made for, it was for their after school kind of crew. So it played kind of like four to five, like when kids get home from school. So it really was, we made it sort of for their teen zone. And then they played it on, yeah, on Saturday mornings for six year olds. <laughs> As if, you know, it's so funny. Uh, tapeworms are so fast. Like, I remember talking about tapeworms all the time as a kid. Mm -hmm. They were just, they're just, they're just a disgusting fascination that all children have. So we just put a real visual to it. I mean, it's, it stands out as one of the highlights of horror in my life. Like, <laughs> oh, good. Uh, oh, good. As a, as a horror director myself, uh, <laughs> Yes. Honestly, they were, they gave us so much freedom. It all happened so fast. And I guess because it was puppets and they were lo looking to really push the envelope. It's funny, I look back and I'm like, wow, you wouldn't get away with a lot of these jokes nowadays, I don't think. Uh, both, both, like, not even just because it was kind of scary or gross, uh, but also just not politically correct. Like, it's just, it's amazing how much the world has changed since 2007. But, uh Nick was super encouraging. They really gave us a, a, a free free reign. Um, I don't know what I, I don't know what I would have done. I don't know what I would have done differently. I, I it seems to be perfect the way it is. Sometimes I'm like, well, maybe if they were like more abstracted, like they were kind of like the characters were like purple and yellow or blue or something like that. Like I'm generally a, usually a fan of sort of like that kind of. That Muppet quality, the, the fact that they're different colors, kind of the ad abstraction is, a, I think, more accessible sometimes, less less uh, less uh, uncanny valley. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, it had its own look, you know, and then, and then right after that, all those things that came out that were kind of not like American Dad or what was it called? No. I don't know, just a lot of unappealing looking cartoons. And I was like, maybe this is the thing. <laughs> That's interesting that you bring up that term, Uncanny Valley, because that definitely is like a, something you would... It's like Mr. Me is one of the few things, that, one of the few puppet things I feel like that could like snag that term. Because I feel like usually with puppetry, people try to take it more fantastical. Yeah. Having a puppet show where it's literally just a mall and some greasy teenagers is... is that's definitely unique to your show in that sense. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uncanny Valley is such an interesting, like, it's just something you think about all the time with puppets. And I generally t try to avoid it. Uh, it was just sort of, we had just done Nanoland, which was super abstract and stylistic. So it was kind of us breaking away from that. And I actually, I have a, I have a, I have a project that I want to make that really takes advantage of Uncanny Valley, like the, the horror of it, kind of like Chucky, you know? Can't, you probably can't see it, but he's Chucky. Right I, can't, I can't believe how long that's been going on. I, there's, I think they were slated to make another series of it in Toronto. It's busy. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, just one more puppet show. <laughs> yeah, he's got to, Chucky's got to have a whole family over for Thanksgiving. And it's always about the family with Chucky. You got the seed of Chucky, the bride of Chucky, Chucky's uncle, uh, uncle. I don't know. It just goes on and on. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of that, like, Uncanny Valley, you know, vibe, the colors, the skins, the production that you use, the, you know, the kinds of materials you use for the puppets that gave it this, like, it wasn't, like, in-your-face nightmare or anything like that, 
but there's just something off about you know their lips and eyes and things like that that I think gave it this nightmare shroud for a lot of kids. And how intentional like was that? <laughs> I think I think not. I don't know. Like it's funny, um, you know. We it was definitely horror themed. Like the whole thing had this kind of like gross horror meaty theme. So it was definitely. Uh, but I think it, you know those we invented those puppets right then and there. Like that was our new form of puppet, um, hot foam kind of Mister Meaty style. You know we had done flocked and fleecy and. So it was sort of us just kind of discovering that I think it was I think it was kind of like we were definitely loving this kind of like uh, almost like the whole thing felt like a puberty pimple. You know, the whole thing felt like a pimple. So that that was kind of something we were going with. I guess we were going with that. And that aesthetic kind of just was that show. And it's funny. I think it's actually almost more pleasurable to watch when you're older because you can you're past that time but i think that's part of why maybe 11 and 12 and people who were pimply and teenagery didn't like it because they're like you know <laughs> you know it was definitely making fun of of being a teenager yeah no there's there's nothing more horrifying than puberty <laughs> there is nothing more there's nothing more horrifying yeah, yeah it has a natural horror to it but I think it was just, it just had, uh, you know, it just, it was just this weird style that we developed for that show that it was very specific to it. I think we had made some hot foam puppets way at the beginning of our career, something called Santa Calls. But they were, they were different still. We did that with cold foam and latex. And then, then that hot foam, which is hardly even used anymore, that material. Now, since then, everybody's using silicone rubber. Maybe not for puppets, though, because the puppets, are, they get pretty heavy when they're made out of rubber. Yeah, those the hot foam ones, those are pretty light, right? Yeah, they were very light. Those are beautiful puppets, and uh, yeah, I don't even know where they are. Yeah, I was going to say, do you, do you have any of those puppets left? I know you have, like, one. Don't you have the uh, Geezer episode puppet? I think I've seen I do. I have that in my back, in my puppet shop. I have um, the Puberty Fairy. And then I have parts of puppets. I kind of like, I, you know, I didn't know afterwards that it would sort of keep on growing. I get people asking me every day for Mr. Meaty puppets. And I, I literally have taken, I, I've sold them to, um, like I made all these uh, puppets for an Inuit television show at a discount rate. And I just made them out of old Mr. Meaty puppets. You can find those online if you ever want to look at... Uh, yeah, Inuit Broadcast Network. I've probably made them about four or five puppets out of Mr. Meaty puppets. That's hilarious. Like just like kind of mismatching parts together. Or... Yeah, mismatching parts and yeah, Mr. Potato Head. They, which is kind of what I do. It's like if you kept every puppet you made, you'd never, you'd never have enough storage. You need a separate house. You need a separate house. house. Yeah. So I, I, I guess, I guess I'm definitely a recycler. But now I'm like, you know what? None of these things are getting famous. I should have held on to them because people want them. Totally. Well, you know, the memories are invaluable. Exactly. <laughs> um, so watching Mr. Meaty episodes, um, it's very clear, like you mentioned, that there is this horror theme kind of going throughout it. And like last night I watched, uh, what is it, Kids Party, which is one of the kids eats some cake and then becomes Reagan from the exorcist and just starts spinning, head starts spinning, crawling backwards in the air vents <laughs> and stuff. And, um, so what, what is your personal relationship to, to horror films? Have you been a fan of them and puppetry and things like the thing or gremlins? Uh, definitely gremlins. I'm from the eighties. So that really was my, I was less into the super horror bloody stuff, more into the creature sci-fi. So definitely like Yoda and Gremlins and E.T. and Goonies and, you know, anything that had a creature in it. There, there was sort of this renaissance when they got really good at creature making and it was practical creatures. And it, it almost didn't last very long like until CG came in. And now, and now there's so many creatures, it's almost, it's almost not, doesn't have the same excitement level. But in the late 70s and early 80s when I was you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 to 15, 
every time a movie came out with new creatures in it, you were like, all right, let's see what this is. Because, uh, you know, it was always the first time that it, uh, we laid our eyes on these things. So, yeah, like the Star Wars bar and loved Gremlins. I just watched Goonies again, which is quite a masterpiece of a film. There, there was just beautiful, uh, heart-filled writing then. But as far as, like, full-on horror, like, I loved Poltergeist. Um, I like the occasional horror. I actually like horror movies now more now, just because movies often quite, they bore me, and, uh, but not a horror movie. They, they can really engage you. Totally, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a huge horror fan myself, and watching, watching Mr. Media episodes, I definitely, you know, from time to time notice those, like, little references to those kind of, like, older movies, which are super fun, and would definitely have gone over the heads of any six-year-old's I mean, I don't know what six-year-old seen The Exorcist, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. We did, yeah, Exorcist, and then Park Arena, I, I referenced uh, American Werewolf in London. I loved that film, too. So I guess I did love that. Yeah, we had that... There was, for a little while, transformation scenes were really all the rage. It, uh, American Werewolf in London, and then there was, like, a... There was even a show based on it, Manimal, and he would transform into different animals... And uh, I guess transforming things has always been a fascination. But uh, yeah, that was, those were pretty influential. Yeah, that part green and transformation is pretty unforgettable. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty insane. Yeah, I studied Seth <laughs> shot for shot that one scene. So I kind of imitated the scene from American Werewolf in London. Would you, would you ever go like, uh, like, put some, make something that was like a hard R or something and like take a puppet thing more extreme? I, I would. Yes, I would. I think I could make a very, very scary film. And um, and I think I might just one day. <laughs> I really would like to. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, you know, I am interested in that kind of stuff that's super, super frightening. And uh, I love creatures. My real love actually was never making sort of silly or cute or even Muppets. Muppets weren't my love as much as uh, werewolves and and vicious creatures. Like that is... Totally. Yeah. I, I saw in your... Uh, I think there was a video you did and you were kind of showing off some fingered puppet newscasters and there was some shots of your, uh, your studio and there was just this gnarly looking werewolf up in the top corner with like blood on its yep. teeth and I was like, oh, what episode of Donna Land is that from? <laughs> yeah. That was a... Yeah, I made that for a friend's... Uh, it's a Weetigo or a Windigo. It's like a Cree demon... Uh, uh, a buck that eats men. So she kind of like uh, was making a, a film, a Cree film like her. So I made that for her. Oh, and I made it like bang. Like I was so excited. I'm so excited anytime. If anybody asked me to make a creature, like a, like a sci-fi creature or a horror thing, it's just, it's all, I'm all into it. I just love doing it. So it, oh, there's definitely more to come in that, in oh. that arena. That's awesome. Yeah, you had mentioned a little before the interview that there, somebody asked you to do a horror project. Is there anything we can know about that? Or, well, um, I um, I am developing a couple of of uh, horror feature film ideas. So um, I guess I'm just writing them right now. So they're not really ready to talk about that much. But yeah, I definitely want to. I think that there's. I have a lot to do with with kind of creatures. I feel like I've got a skill for uh, creating, like making the inanimate move. I, you know, so many years of puppeteering and building has given me, I think, a, a unique ability to make things that just animate, animate well and, and with realism. And uh, so I'm excited for that kind of phase of things. I will be staying tuned, as I'm sure many of our viewers will. Um, so, okay, so this is something that I've always been very curious about. So Mr. Meaty, um, you know, had those horror elements and scared the shit out of children. It's awesome. Traumatized. I hope you get some, I hope you get some kind of kick out of the fact that you <laughs> scared so many kids, because I certainly would. <laughs> I would hold it as like a weird, demented metaphor. <laughs> yeah, there's... I 
fun job. There's a, I definitely, it is, yeah, I guess I'm a little bit proud of it. I feel a little bit bad too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there was any serious damage done. Yeah, no serious damage. Good. Yeah, yeah. you as one of the kids that was traumatized, you know. Yeah. You no, just ended up making was... horror, horror. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah, now I make horror movies. I got my first feature out. So, you know, Mr. Media is probably to blame for my weird horror obsession, so. Wow, congratulations. Um, but uh, when Mr. Meaty, uh like, did that get canceled? Were you guys just done with the project? Did it have to do with that kid reaction? How did that end? I think it was, there was like a lot of that negative style review. Uh, I think that was what kind of did it. I think Nickelodeon, maybe they don't hold, they don't try things out as long nowadays. Mm -hmm. But I think it was also early internet. So I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding that, if people are complaining about something, it doesn't mean they necessarily don't like it. I think right. now we know that, you know, negative attention is almost better than good attention. So if they had kind of rolled with it, I bet you they could have had a bigger hit on their hands because they are definitely funny. Like they're laugh out loud, funny episodes. So that uh, and I and it has this kind of like fan base, despite the little squirts of episodes people can find on YouTube. So. There's something to it. I, I think it was just there, and I was obsessed with reading the talk, all the uh, comment boards and that kind of thing, and uh, it was funny how much kids hated it, and they talked about that. <laughs> how uh, how did you handle like that show ending? Was that difficult for you? Uh, you know, it was so busy during those years. Uh, I was fine. I mean, I was fine. We ended up doing a show called Big and Small and Apollo's Pad and then and then made a movie with uh, uh, one of the guys from uh, the Where Are the Wild Things did all the voices for it. It was like a, a short called Higgledy Piggledy Pop with Clyde Henry. So uh, my career's never stopped. It's never stopped being busy, doing interesting, lovely things. It would have, it would have been nice to do another season of Mr. Meaty, that's for sure, or to have had a show that did was on air and had huge popularity. I think that really puts you into a new a new realm, you know. And then you're then you're a creator like uh, Mike Judd or uh, who's the guy with the story wheel that does um, Rick and Morty, Dan Harmon. You know that guy's unstoppable, and uh, he deserves he deserves it too, though. Yeah, I think uh, I think you have a really good outlook on it, and I think that a lot of artists can learn. From, you know, just that idea of, yes, you're going to have these, like, great opportunities that, you know, societally might look, like, more exciting or better or whatever. But ultimately, these different projects are just different chapters. And when something comes to an end, having more of that attitude of, like, well, that's over. What's next? Yeah. Things happen for a reason. You know, what's, cha what's the next chapter going to look like rather than stewing in that, you know, is a great, is a great outlook to have. Yeah. I mean... I mean, don't tell anyone, but I mean, it's it's one of the scary things about television is that the goal is to have something that never ends. And I've that doesn't appeal to me as a creative person. I'm like, I like the I like doing something while I still love it and then finishing it, not doing something ad infinite, you know, until it's, you know, a lot of things, most things kind of have that kind of crash when the, you can tell the creator has just stepped back and they can't take it anymore unless you're South Park. And those guys have some magical formula that keeps them forever, forever inspired to do the same thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't get those guys. They're crazy. They're crazy. I know, and they're yeah. just they. It keeps on, keeps on improving and being interesting. And uh, they, that's that's their magic. They should do some TED talks on like how to how to keep the magic alive. How to stay inspired on one idea for your entire career. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, I don't even know if I'd want to attend that seminar. I think I like that I get bored of my own ideas. That's okay. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, you only get one life. So do you really want to, you know, stamp that one thing the whole time? You gotta, you want, you want to, you want to try different things. I have a million things I want to do. Yeah. How do you, uh, you know, post working with studios and things like that? You know, how is you as an independent puppeteer and, and artist, like, how do you make your ends meet doing jobs for people? Um, I just, um, 
you know, I've made so many puppets that uh, I get a lot of gigs just making puppets for commercials or movies or TV shows. Um, it it kind of got easy to... Not many people get a chance to make a million puppets because there's not that many jobs to do it. So you end up kind of like rising above the rest and then you've, then you've got all the skills just because it's all I've ever... I've made a thousand puppets, so... I really, people bring me in, you know, to do all, all sorts of different kind of like movement-based creature things. So I do that. And um, right now I'm working for Spin Master. Actually, I'm, I, I took a full-time job. I'm creating stuff for their YouTube channel. And uh, that's really fun. They just want pure creative work that will bring in viewers, which is one of my expertise. So I love that. And then, uh, yeah, and just... Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Just enough enough gigs are always coming in or stuff I create myself to keep totally. you going. That's that's the perfect place you want to be at. That's that's where every artist I think wants to be. So yeah. you're in a super awesome position there. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah, and yeah, I congratulations to you. Thank that's you. That's awesome. Thank you. I mean I would like to I think I do want to make another push and I think there's a part of me that has uh avoids Hollywood to a certain degree. I don't. I didn't know this until I kind of recently was like, oh, I guess I have a little bit of self defeatism Get when I get into the big the big leagues, and there's also just, but the, maybe there's also there's a pleasure in working and making things without that super duper tension. Like you, you know, when there's a lot of money on set when nobody's having fun, <laughs> you know, and it's just things things get things when they're kind of like have really big budgets. Uh, they're very competitive with one another, all the puppeteers and all the directors and everybody. So I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just a a, a Canadian at heart, a, a, mo a humble Canadian or something. But I don't know. I, I I think I'd like another shot. I think I I'd like to put some more ideas out there as well. I think uh, I watch so much that I think is empty of true inspiration or uh, you know just you know heartfelt value. And I think I could do that still. Totally. So, I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of projects and ideas still that you want to tackle. Um, as you move forward with new productions and making new things, um, if there's like an aspiring, you know, puppeteer person or somebody who just wants to get involved on set or something like that, are there ways for people to get involved in your productions? Is that a thing? Um I mean, I, I, I always, people are, I'm always hiring people. Um, and, uh, it just, uh, it just depends on the timing and that kind of thing. Like I just have these three students from Sheridan school, which is a great animation school that have helped me with the last couple projects. They were first my interns and then I hired them. And then, um, you know, I, it depends when a production comes up and then sometimes I'm hiring 15 people I'm like I gotta make a million puppets and you know it's a uh, I'm kind of a last I'm not last minute guy but people come to me in the last minute I guess because like you know just the way things go they spend two years designing and deciding what it's going to look like and the concept and then they're like all right we've got two weeks to build it now and then they and then you know so they need somebody who can do that because all puppet making is it's huge it's so laborious it's no matter no matter how much how many people you put on it and how much work you put into it there's always an all nighter there's always like a, an all nighter at the end totally yeah i mean we we live that here at bad taste video for sure um that last minute call to action and frankly um and i feel like you probably fall into the same boat just by that answer which would be uh i love we love working under pressure here. Just like, it's just yeah. like when it just feels like the clock is ticking and it's like, okay, we're going to just every night get the Red Bull, like whatever, let's work, let's work. Like, I like that more than like the eight months long deadline or whatever. I like the eight weeks or eight days. Yeah, it's fun. You're, it's fun. You, you And you have to give your all to something. Like, I, I like that. And I, I really, I am able to do that where it's just, I can, you know, you just have to, think about everything that can go wrong and everything that can waste your time and, you know, read the label and find out if this glue dries in two hours or four hours and all those choices matter. And it's kind of fun. It's, it is fun to have that pressure. Totally. Um, so 
are there i'm curious are you aware of any like new names uh of like upcoming artists who you're kind of checking out who maybe our viewers should keep an eye out for hmm in in what realm the horror <laughs> just like any artists uh kind of in the film sphere who you're like oh you know that guy's doing good work or this new movie i saw or this puppeteer or somebody maybe one of the people you're working with that you hired on is doing stuff wow you know it's so funny i just look at so much i am i'm a fan of so many things it's almost i always find it difficult when someone asks me how who who specifically um i uh I can't really think of it. Let me think. <laughs> if someone comes to my mind, I'm kind of like, I'm doing, I'm learning Adobe character animator. I'm learning to animate puppets, uh, animate real animation things. I'm pretty interested in face swap, face swapping stuff. I'm really interested in the Oculus Quest 2 that I just got myself. So kind of learning about that kind of like 3D space and uh i mean all that stuff's very very you know entertaining I, I don't know i watch movies all the time and then i can't think of them if somebody asked me that what i'm what i'm up to are there any good like uh festivals or kind of like any festivals that you attend regularly that also highlight other i would love to go to i'd love to go to that i think apparently horror movie festivals are the best and I haven't been to that very many. There's one in Montreal, um, Frontiers, and there's one in Sitges in uh, Spain. That's like the horror capital pr pretty much because of this amazing, um, and they, you know what the amazing thing is that whole B-movie culture is they're the nicest people in the world. Like all the, uh, all the stuff I just said about the high tension Hollywood is not in the horror movie realm. I, I think, like, for two reasons. One, I think you can't make it that much money. Like, it's it's it it's an industry that just kind of gets by. And I also think that if people are more aware of the darker side and they're kind of, like, more into exploring their, you know, dark side, there's a, there's a humanity that comes from that, I, I guess. It's like, I, like in children's television, you go to a children's television market or festival and everybody's like, hi, hi, hi. And it, the smiles, and then any kind of darkness, they're just ignoring it. So it just comes in kind of weird ways around the corner. Uh, whereas, like you, you meet horror movie people, and they're sweet, and they're just, um, they just have integrated their dark side, so that's not, it's not sneaking around the corner and get biting people. Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. That's that's actually such an interesting thought. I really never thought about it. That yeah. Way. Just that idea that. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, people who are into horror are putting all of their nasty feelings and expressing them onto the screen, so then they're not expressing it onto you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thing. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's 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 Jungian. It's Jungian stuff. Like it really is. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Here, I'm looking through my book to see if I could find anything that I've done <laughs> or or to suggest anything. Um, Maybe like other filmmakers you know of or something. Other, like uh, yeah, other filmmakers, etc. Yeah, there's, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm not up on stuff as I should be. <laughs> if you if you think of anything even after the interview, you can text me and I can I can throw it in there. All right. Uh, so okay, so last couple questions here, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, let's see. So the uh, the so yeah, basically, what's uh you know. How can people keep up to up to snap with you and the projects you're doing? You know, plug your socials. I, I have an insta. I have an Instagram, um, Jay Shananana. Um, I am about to start a TikTok, and I'm um, I have a Facebook group. Uh, my company's called Puppet Island, and I think I'm going to start changing all my things called that because I my puppet shop's on an, on an island <laughs> and I have a, I ride a boat to work uh often I have a tugboat that I take to work so that's puppet island is my company and I'm going to start uh just putting that across all the social media but in the meantime it's at j shenananana uh for when I do post awesome yeah the tiktok's a good idea we 
we recently decided, ah, what the hell, we'll, we'll try this TikTok thing, kind of like not really caring. We uploaded like one music video from like three years ago. We uploaded like 10 seconds of it on a TikTok and then it got more views than the original video has. And we were like, what the hell? And it just started yeah. spreading around. It's it's kind of an explosive territory right now. Yeah, it really is. That is the, like everybody gives all their attention to one medium and really when the when it comes out at the beginning that's that's the time to really rise in 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 a medium in that medium just like reels yeah. on Instagram you got to get in those reels mm -hmm. that's yep. what, you just got to keep what's new what's working and just like put your ego aside and just like do it yeah 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 totally well, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on this episode of Rocco Reviews and doing this interview with me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Glad to be here. Thank you, Rocco. It's nice to meet you. I've seen your stuff a little bit here and there, and you're a very inspired guy. You're doing good hey, stuff. Thank you very much. That means the world coming from you. And uh, to thank you for, for doing this interview with me today and, and spending some time with the Bad Taste team send you this uh, free copy of I Need You Dead, our, our first feature film. Oh, yeah, all right. A little Christmas present. For is it, what is it on, a DVD? Yeah, it's on a DVD. Wow. I got to see if I have anything that plays a DVD. you <laughs> <laughs> got a VHS player? I do. I do have a DVD player. I have okay. an external one on a USB. There you go. That'll work. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. I appreciate your time. And, uh, yeah, we'll... All right. Good luck. Bad taste. <laughs>